it again. Early in our relationship, when we were in college, Micah and I used to have joking conversations where we argued about which was better, neuroscience or psychology. Clearly it's psychology. I was focused on understanding the biology of the brain. And I wanted to understand the mind and consciousness. All those conversations were a long time ago, and for many years we've been in firm agreement that neither psychology nor neuroscience is better than the other. What? But but <laughs> they are different. And since we're not flirtatiously trying to one-up the other person anymore, or at least usually not about that, it's not something we've given that much thought to recently, until we started talking to one of our patrons about it. Ryan Shaver, a philosophy student, brainiac extraordinaire, and longtime supporter of neurotransmissions, approached us with a really interesting and complicated topic that he's actually written about in the past. How and why did the study of the brain split into the vast and very different fields of neuroscience and psychology. Well, we thought that sounded pretty interesting and a pretty awesome topic. And thanks to his generous backing all these years, we've decided that Ryan is actually gonna be our sponsor for this video. When you get to the end of the video and you realize that we did not seamlessly transition into an ad read, well, you can thank Ryan. Actually, why don't you just go ahead and give him a thanks right now in the comments. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so buckle in, kids, because we're digging into a brief history of brain sciences. Now, when we say brief, well, we're not very good at being brief, especially not lately. But I do want to note that we're going to cover a lot here today. So if you want to learn more about, well, almost everything we're going to talk about, you should check out our book, Brains Explained, available now wherever books are sold. I thought that we said we weren't going to do an ad. Well. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go buy our book. I think that the first big question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is the difference between psychology and neuroscience today? We asked some of our friends about this, and there are sort of two kinds of answers here. Mm -hmm. The first is that these two fields actually overlap a lot. We know plenty of people who work in neuroscience and psychology research, and some of the questions that people are asking, especially the folks in the more cognitive science realm, are definitely somewhere between psychology and neuroscience, and don't firmly fit into either category. <laughs> but if we do have to split the two fields up, I'd guess that most people would say neuroscience primarily studies the biology of the brain, including brain structures and cells, while psychology primarily studies the psyche, consciousness, and behavior. So if we split neuroscience and psychology along those lines, then you could say that neuroscience is all about the body mm -hmm. and psychology is all about the mind, yeah, right? Fair. And if you're familiar with philosophy, then that split might sound kind of familiar. Mm -hmm. French philosopher René Descartes of I Think Therefore I Am fame was a big proponent of the idea of mind-body dualism. And this philosophical perspective on consciousness and the mind essentially draws the line between our physical bodies and the substrate of the mind, mm -hmm. essentially. So this theory separates what it considers the intangible nature of consciousness from the physical reality of the brain as a source of intelligence. Descartes had an interesting illustration to try and explain this theory. Check it out. Oh. <laughs> Basically, he thought that sensory information, like light and sound, was received and processed by the brain, and then it was passed on to our intangible spiritual self, which existed in a non-physical form outside of the body. But is there any evidence that this theory is correct? Well, not really, but there also isn't super solid evidence that it isn't correct. There are lots of people studying the biology of consciousness, working to understand how the structures and connections of our brains come together to make each of us a unique, independent human being. There's also a lot of research looking at how different kinds of brain injuries affect personality and behavior, which you could argue demonstrates a direct impact on the mind. I personally think it's most likely that the physical structures of our brains, which are marked by our life experiences, our memories, and environmental and genetic influences, all come together in a complicated mess to make each of us who we are. 
But it's still possible that Descartes was right, and that on the other side of the brain's biology, there exists some intangible, separate thing that is or causes our human consciousness. But let's not put Descartes in front of the horse. Whether or not <laughs> Descartes was right or wrong, it's still a decent way to think about the division between neuroscience and psychology. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much as there is one, right. right? Neuroscientists are trying to understand how the brain works, which can include questions about consciousness in the mind. Mm -hmm. And psychologists are mostly focused on understanding the workings of the mind, but obviously that has ties to the functioning of the brain. So there's plenty of overlap, but we can agree that at least on its surface, the split between mind and body is also the split between neuroscience and psychology. However, that doesn't explain how neuroscience and psychology became separate fields. This is true. You might think that neuroscience is younger than psychology because our technology for studying biology has advanced so much mm. in just the last 70 years or so. But neuroscience has, to some degree, been around for a very long time, even if we didn't really know that much about what we were poking around at up there. <laughs> and it's been closely entwined with what we might call psychology pretty much that whole time. As far back as ancient Greece, some natural philosophers like Hippocrates were already thinking that the brain was the seat of intelligence, while others, like Aristotle, thought it was the heart. Galen of ancient Rome believed the opposite of Descartes, saying there was no difference or division between the mental and the physical. He was pretty ahead of his time for that one, but not all of Galen's ideas were good. He also thought that semen was produced by the brain. So yeah, uh, to be honest, neuroscience wasn't really a thing in ancient civilizations like Greece because dissections of the human brain were illegal. At least until about 300 BC, when Herophilus and Erasistratus were permitted to conduct their anatomical dissections, which led to cool discoveries like the distinction between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. But while this was an interesting anatomical discovery, was it really neuroscience? Uh... I mean, ancient Egyptians were removing brains as part of their mummification process yeah. way back in the day, but like, I wouldn't classify that as neuroscience. Yeah. They just thought that it was just another organ to throw in the trash, mm -hmm. right? Same thing for psychology. I mean, a lot of early civilizations thought that mental illnesses were some kind of demonic possession or something. And so treatments typically involved superstitions or incantations. Mm -hmm. But that's not really psychology, no. right? I, I guess it's psychology adjacent. I don't know, it's murky. I mean, there are a lot of examples of early forms of what you might call psychology and neuroscience, but they're still super different from our modern understanding. Mm. For example, Plato thought we had three psyches. Is that the start? Mm. Chinese monk Lin Ji conducted the first supposed psychology test. Is that the marker? Or take your pick of your favorite religion, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism. They all had early concepts of the self or the soul. It feels like there are a ton of examples of proto-neuroscience and proto-psychology out there, but they all look very different from our modern understanding. I agree, but we need to put an arbitrary stake in the ground somewhere, right? <laughs> Not really, but maybe the best place to point to as the start of old neuroscience would be our earliest example of neurology seen during the Islamic Golden Age. Some physicians like Avicenna studied the brain by doing surgeries after head injuries and by observing symptoms of folks who were experiencing mental illnesses. Mm. In his first medical encyclopedia, which is the first such encyclopedia we know about mm -hmm. in existence, <laughs> right? He discussed a variety of neuropsychiatric conditions such as hallucinations, epilepsy, dementia, and insomnia. And around the same time, there are a lot of really cool things happening in psychology too. A physician named Abu Bakr Muhammad Ibn Zikaria al-Razi wrote over 200 books on medical observations that included mental and neurological illnesses, and he even developed the first recorded psychiatric ward where he treated people by providing them therapy. He even developed psychotherapy techniques that he employed with his patients, though it wasn't called psychotherapy at the time. Later, during the Italian Renaissance, Andreas Vesalius took issue with a lot of the things that our buddy Galen said about the brain, <laughs> mostly because Galen didn't ever actually look at human brains, but instead studied animals like macaques. 
Vesalius conducted public dissections of human bodies, including the brain, and had illustrators draw what he found, and so was able to identify a number of important brain structures, such as the corpus callosum. Leonardo da Vinci also did some stellar anatomical drawings of the brain, but he had to hide them during his lifetime, as human dissections were not legal. Of course, during and after the Renaissance, a number of people, mostly philosophers at that time, got interested in psychological questions, though Again, they weren't called that at the time. The term psychology was first used by Croatian humanist Marko Marulic in the late 15th or early 16th century, but it came into use in English by the late 1600s, along with our friend René Descartes. Mm -hmm. Many of the great philosophers of the Enlightenment were very interested in psychology. Notable names include Christian Wolff, who considered psychology its own science, and Immanuel Kant, who pushed forward anthropology with psychology as an important component of the field. There were also some very neuroscience-y experiments going on around then, such as the work of Luigi Galvani. He and his wife were conducting experiments on static electricity using frog skin, when a spark jumped from a charged scalpel to the exposed sciatic nerve in the frog's leg which made the leg twitch. He called this twitch animal electricity, which he believed powered the muscles. This was the start of electrophysiology, which is focused on studying the electrical properties of the brain and how our neurons use electricity to send signals. Some years later, a young writer named Mary Shelley would mention Galvani's work as part of the inspiration for her famous horror novel, Frankenstein. Frank. Nice. <laughs> Once we get into the late 1800s and early 1900s, then we enter into the modern era of psychology, <laughs> and you start to see some scientists and psychologists who you may have heard of, you know, like Freud, <laughs> the famous first psychotherapist and cocaine-loving mother lover. More on that up there. Mm -hmm. Or Pavlov, the dog lover. Not really, he was pretty awful to dogs. Or Jung, the dream interpreter and best friend of Freud. <laughs> And the list just keeps going on and on. There were a lot of conversations about trying to understand what motivates people or mm -hmm. what goes wrong in the mind and how we find meaning in our lives. Mm -hmm. Therapy was in its infancy at the time. Freud essentially created the field. And this is also the time when famous brain injuries like those of Phineas Gage or Victor Laborn, nicknamed Patient Tan, popped up in our history and led physicians to make connections between injuries in particular brain areas and their effects on cognition and behavior. A bit later on, we had Ramonica Hall and Golgi debating the nature of the neurons within our brain, with Golgi thinking that they were all one big connected mass of tissue, sort of like a web or a system of tubes, while Ramonica Hall was pretty sure that they were separate individual cells. Golgi also invented an incredible technique for staining and viewing individual neurons, which Ramoni Cajal used to study and draw them. Learn more about their debate and check out some of Ramoni Cajal's beautiful drawings in this video. As we get into the 1900s, we start to see more distinct shifts in the separation between neuroscience and psychology. Folks like Hodgkin and Huxley started to dig into the physical properties of the brain and how it sends signals. In their case, they used the giant squid axon to investigate the physics of the electrical signals sent by neurons. More up there. So many videos. <laughs> we also saw a huge boom in behaviorism, which essentially tried to argue that you could understand all aspects of the mind just by observing our behaviors. This is where B.F. Skinner started stuffing pigeons in boxes to guide missiles during World War II. <laughs> this was the point where psychology really started using the experimental method. Folks weren't just speculating on the nature of consciousness or the structure of the brain. They were actually coming up with hypotheses and attempting to test them in rigorous ways. This might be a good place to witness the divide between the two fields of psychology and neuroscience, because although researchers were using the same scientific method, you could see a distinction in the types of questions that were being asked. So scientists were starting to pick apart much more scientific questions like, how does a neuron send a signal? Or how does childhood trauma affect our development as we age? Or what functions do certain brain regions have? Or how do we respond in the face of authority? Other new discoveries, like unpacking the structure of DNA and the development of incredibly powerful microscopes, mm. gave scientists the tools they needed to really dig into the cellular and molecular biology of the brain. Mm. 
In fact, some scientists such as Eric Kandel argue that the 1950s and 1960s are when neuroscience truly became its own distinct field, mostly because that was when we started to be able to pick apart how brain cells worked. My graduate program at UC San Diego was, I believe, actually the first formal neurosciences graduate program when it started in 1969. Wow. Nice. That's odd. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of those new techniques and technologies have also made it possible for us to study the biology of the brain in a lot of different animal models, from worms to flies to mice to monkeys, rapidly expanding our understanding of the structure and function of the brain and its components. And of course, psychology kept plowing along, even as neuroscience really started to veer off into its own thing, right? On the applied side of psychology, huge advances were made in therapy, particularly in evidence-based practices like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is now sort of the gold standard for psychotherapy. Mm. Even perspectives on pathologizing different psychiatric conditions or illnesses such as autism, anxiety disorders, or eating disorders have shifted dramatically. There have also been tons and tons of psychology research studies focused specifically on behavior. And of course, psychology research is still ongoing today. One big area of interest right now is in better understanding global psychological trends. You might not know this, but most of the published psychology research out there was conducted in what we call weird populations. That's not very nice. <laughs> where weird stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Mm -hmm. Even more specifically, a lot of existing psychology research was done in white college students, and often just in white male college students for a long time. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's still happening. If you've ever attended a psychology class in college, you were probably asked to participate in studies happening on campus. Your teacher might even have given you extra credit for doing so. And as shocked as the psychologists of yesteryear may be by this fact, it turns out that the white male college student experience is not universal. <laughs> These days, psychology research generally encompasses the behavioral, cognitive, and social realms, mm -hmm. studying how people interact with each other and with information and environments, as well as the places where psychology overlaps with other topics that humans care about, like economics or advertising or education. Neuroscience, on the other hand, mm -hmm. typically focuses on the physical phenomena of the brain. Some would argue that neuroscience as a whole aims to explain all psychological processes by clarifying all of the biology that generates them. But whether or not neuroscience is capable of doing that is a whole other story. <laughs> I mean, if we go back to the mind-body dualism debate, we're not even sure that the mind is just a product of the brain. So there might be something else beyond the biology that generates our consciousness. And like we said at the top, there's still a lot of overlap between the two fields. Some of that is related to how researchers are trying to understand the connection between the mind and the body. Like, where is the seat of consciousness? Is our soul just a result of the structures of our brain? How do changes in neuronal signaling or in brain structure size lead to psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder? And how can we treat those conditions with medication and with therapy? Today's technology lets us pick apart at some of the tiniest molecules in the body and surf through massive data sets of tens of thousands of genes and proteins. It also lets us directly track blood flow or electrical activity in the brain, and in some ways even lets us read minds. I mean, we're learning new stuff about the brain so quickly that the textbooks that I used in college just 10 years ago are now totally out of date. Absolutely, same thing for psychology. Mm -hmm. In fact, a growing number of research and graduate programs are starting to recognize the overlap between the fields and are providing opportunities in both arenas. So. Cognitive science is a good example of an arena that combines the elements of both neuroscience and psychology, as well as linguistics and computer science to conduct scientific studies of the brain. Neuropsychology is another area that seeks to address questions on both sides of that divide. There are even programs like at the University of California, Santa Barbara, they have the Dynamical Neuroscience Graduate Program that tries to develop specifically interdisciplinary spaces to address these topics. And there's some programs that are just called 
brain science <laughs> in order to be more encompassing. And I kind of like that term. Yeah, it's a good one. Even my graduate program at UC San Diego had people studying questions across the spectrum of neuroscience and right up to the edge of psychology, mm -hmm. working to understand the neural correlates of behavior. So it may be more accurate to consider neuroscience and psychology as complementary and overlapping fields, rather than considering them to be totally separate or even at odds with one another. They're all brain sciences. They just have slightly different foci. Foci. Interesting. Why? What would you say? Foci. I don't think it's foci. I think it's foci. All right. Foci. Boom. <laughs> I stand corrected. You're so proud of yourself. Now, this was a very brief history of brain science, and we mostly talked about how our two fields, psychology and neuroscience, mm -hmm. have evolved with time. So if you want to learn more about any of these topics, then you should definitely check out our book, Brains Explained, where we talk about almost all of this stuff, but in more depth mm -hmm. and detail. And we also dig into the works of a lot of other scientists and physicians and psychologists and cool people. So seriously, it's it's all in here. Seriously, we really had so much fun writing this book. We really hope that if you haven't already, you will take a minute to check it out because it's, we think, we love really it. great. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much to Ryan for all of his support over the years and especially for his help deciding on this video's topic and for the feedback he gave on its contents. Thanks, Ryan. We are so grateful for his help making neurotransmissions awesome, and for the support of all of our patrons for making this work possible. And for all of you, all of you watching this video right now, we're just so thankful for your support over the years. So thanks for watching this episode of Neurotransmissions. Until our next transmission, I'm Ali Astrocyte. And I'm Micah. Over and out. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs>